Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. On today's show, archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling joins us again from the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, to help us better understand the Amarna letters and their relationship to the book of Joshua and the early chapters of Judges. Scott, welcome back again to Digging for Truth. Good to see you. Hey, I'm always excited to be with you, Henry. All right. So uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, for our audience, this is part two on the Amarna letters. Uh, before we sort of jump into what we want to, specifics we want to talk about today, maybe you could just give a quick overview to, to sort of connect them back to the first episode, and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. We have 382 clay tablets written in cuneiform script uh, found at Tel El Amarna in Egypt when uh, uh, Egypt converted under Akhenaten to, to monotheism, at least to some degree. Uh, and it's kind of funny because they went from worshipers of the sun, Ra, to worshipers of the sun, Disc, uh, Aten. But it is a sort of monotheism, which is really interesting. And uh, the it's a series of correspondence between Canaanite Egyptian city-states and Pharaoh back in Egypt, and a series of complaints, really, from these guys. And then we have a subset of it that are sort of brothers of Pharaoh, rulers of larger kingdoms, and they're treated uh, much differently. But they're complaining primarily about this group known as the Habiru, which we said we believe is most likely the biblical Hebrews, and it gives us a real insight into what's happening in and immediately after the initial conquest uh, takes place. Excellent. So uh, we, again, encourage folks to go back and watch part one to sort of contextualize what we're going to talk about here. All right, so our goal here, Scott, is instructive for the audience, but we want to move, we're going to move to a, a, a new idea that you have about one of the tablets, which is fascinating. But before we do that, let's, let's zero in on a series of letters, letters 285 to 290. Mm -hmm. uh, they are from the king of Jerusalem, and I won't say any more. I'll let you explain further. Yeah, uh, 285 to 290, and these have been artificially numbered. They're not like on the tablets, 285 to 290, but uh, we have scholars like Albright uh, early on did some really good work on this, and you got to really admire him because you know, he was breaking new ground uh, on it. And then in more recent times, Anson Rainey, uh, recently deceased, and uh, William Moran has a classic text on it, and those are the, the sources that we usually go to. But it's an ongoing source of, you know, PhD dissertations being written on this, and who knows if there will be other Amarna tablets that will surface at some point that will give us um, additional insights. So um, interesting series of correspondence when we focus on 285 to 290, which are the Jerusalem letters. And these are written from Abdi Hiba, king of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, and the, the Bible gives us the name of the king at the time of the conquest as Adonai Zedek. And um, so either Abdi Hiba is the king that follows Ad Adonai Zedek um, after he's, he's killed, um, or it's a synonymous name, perhaps. Okay, very good. So, so, uh, the, the date is about 30 year period, early judges. So we're, so at least the conventional dating, this is where we think this is, this is pretty accurate. So it's interesting because Joshua 10 indicates that the king was killed. There was a coalition of kings that mm -hmm. Joshua defeated uh, at Makeda, I believe is, is the place mm -hmm. where that occurred. But it doesn't say that they conquered the city. And so this would be consistent with that sort of, uh, we don't see a text where it says, that they took control of Jerusalem. And so we have Abdi Heba. What's he saying there in these correspondences? Yeah, to <clears throat> he's crying out to Pharaoh and, and complaining. We're going to look at 288 in a minute, and I'll give you some examples of specific complaints that he has. But he's whining about the other city-states, and they're not doing their part, and uh, they're, they're helping the enemy, and they're throwing Pharaoh under the bus and talking trash behind his back and so forth. So it's a series of, of petty complaints, but really, you know, he, he's making a good point is that I still want to be loyal to you and I want to pay my tribute this year, but I'm not going to be able to if you don't send us some military help. Yeah, and includes, uh, if, if I remember reading from the text, he, archers, he's asking for archers to be sent. He's asking for, for help. So, so what does he need help from? I mean, who, who, what's the, who's the problem here? Uh, that's uh, afflicting poor Abdi Heba. Well, it, it's the Habiru. 
and they are uh, overrunning these cities. And some of the cities, like uh, Shechem, famously, uh, they have allied themselves. The king of Shechem and his sons, they have allied themselves. And so that entire Shechem city-state has gone uh, Hebrew. It's gone Habiru at this point, which is, again, very consistent with what we read in the conquest. And, you know, we're taking the reading of the Masoretic text and and putting us uh, for a conquest around 1400. Um, if you were to take the Septuagint reading, that would take off 40 years, and it would put you then in the mid-14th century, around 1360, which very interesting would be right in the middle of this sure. uh, when it's taken place. So it's interesting to look at it from two different lenses. So either it's um, just after the conquest and it's the ongoing conquest or phase two of the conquest, or if one were taking the Septuagint reading, you would see this as literally uh, an unfolding of the biblical conquest. Right, right. So, so, you know, after the Israelites conquer I, Joshua 8, they go right up to Shechem to perform the covenant renewal ceremony, right? Right. And so so right. talk about that in terms of how the, the Amarna letters sort of fill in, explain, well, how did they do that? They didn't fight a war. There's no indication of a war. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Right. So it's actually at the end of chapter eight, they do what Moses told them to do. He said, when you go into the land and you gain a foothold, you're going to go and renew covenant with me, with Mount Gerizim on one side, Mount Ebal on the other, and he gives them all these details. So they do it after victory at Ai, and the people at Shechem don't fight the Israelites. Instead, they join in with them. And the text says that all Israel joined in together, alien and citizen alike. And so the people of Shechem uh, apparently are embracing monotheism or Yahwehism, and maybe this goes back to the deep patriarchal roots at, at Shechem. And so what I see in that, then, is very consistent with what we read uh, in the Amarna letters, that these, there's a, an affinity between the people of Shechem and the Habiru, and if Shechem is the head of the city-state, then cities like Shiloh are part of the Shechem city-state, and we see nothing in the Bible about a conquest or a battle at at Shiloh, just as Joshua set up the tabernacle there, yet we know archaeologically that there were people who were there. Excellent. So, um, so what we have described in the biblical text is the southern campaign, Joshua 10, then, and, and you have this covenant and renewal ceremony that takes place just before that's described. You have the northern campaign, and you have this lacuna in between of no campaign, and yet in the, right. Amarna, in the Amarna letters are saying that the Shechemites are consorting with the Habiru. Yeah, uh, what a fascinating connection. It's, it's very fascinating. It's very consistent with what we would expect it to be. We don't find anything in the Amarna letters that contradicts what we would expect it to be from reading the biblical text. Excellent, excellent. All right, so in our next segment, we're going to be talking about Shiloh and a possible close connection between that city described in the Bible and the Amarna letters, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, and he's also the director of the Shiloh Excavations, uh, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. Okay, Scott, so we set the stage. We've been telling the audience here a little bit that we may have a Shiloh connection mm -hmm. with the Amarna letters, but I'm going to let you sort of pull back the curtain on that and see, <laughs> and see how persuasive your suggestion is. Okay, well, all dig directors are guilty of seeing the whole world through the prism of their dig side, okay? So uh, <laughs> we have a saying in Spanish that uh, 
every mother blackbird thinks her little bird is the blackest. So um, uh, clearly, I think that my side is the best side, and I want to see everything through that prism. But I, in just studying the Amarna letters, when I came across this, I began to explore it, and it just seemed like it was the further I got that it was really something serious that we should talk about. And so I've run this by e Egyptologists that are very renowned, by Assyriologists and linguists, and uh, everybody seems to agree with me that this is should have serious consideration. So um, let's talk about EA-288. So remember that 285 to 290 are the Abdihiba Jerusalem letters, and this 288 um, kind of gets to the, the heart of what we want to talk about. And it begins with this whole thing, I prostrate myself before the king seven times, and uh, behold, I'm a friend of the king and a tribute bearer. In other words, I'm a financial supporter. He's reminding him that, you know, I'm a, a, a resource for you. Um, then he goes on giving other complaints. It, my father and my mother didn't place me on the throne, but your, your royal hand did. Uh, and then I'll just kind of read a bit here. Um, he says, and so I sent 10 slaves uh, to you, two girls and eight prisoners, and um, may the king give thought to his land. So he doesn't claim that, that he owns the land. He says, it's Pharaoh's land. The land of the king is lost. All of it has attacked me. And so, in other words, I alone am holding out for you here. I'm at war as far as the land of Seru and as far as Ginti Kirmil. All the mares are at peace, but I am at war. So he's clearly begging for help. I am treated like an apiru. <laughs> now, here we go again. So they're treating me like I'm a, I'm a monotheist, you know, one of these despised dogs, these brigands. Uh, and I do not visit the king, my lord, since I'm at war. So that's why I haven't been to see you. Um, I am situated like a ship at sea. So this interesting uh, simile here, I'm a ship that's at sea and I can't quite get to, to the king. Um, the strong hand or arm of the king took the land of Naharima and the land of Kasi, but now the Apiru have taken the very cities of the king. So who's in control in Canaan, Henry? Sounds like the Apiru to me and not Abdihiba, and, or not yeah. the king, not the pharaoh. It, it's being well, relinquished. Yeah, so the Pharaoh was in control or is in control, and it's in the process of being lost. So yes. even after the initial conquest, it's still Egypt who's in control in, in Canaan. So not a here we go. Not a single mare remains to the king, my lord. All are lost. And then we get down to the Shiloh section, verses 41 to 47 in 288. Behold, Turbasu was slain in the city gate of Silu. Silu. Now, we call this toponymy, the similarity of, study of the similarity of place names. So Silu, I mean, what could this possibly mean? What are the possibilities? Well, scholars up to this point have taken this to mean Sile or Churu, if you translate it, which is a fort down on the Egyptian fortress near the Bala Lakes in Egypt proper. Okay. Now, if, if that's true, then it is out of character with everything else in the Amarna letters, because why would cities in Egypt proper be attacked by the Habiru, for one thing, and why would they need, need protection? He's talking about Canaanite city-states and locations that are being sieged and turning over, and then he automatically throws out this, this sile, they would say, the, the fort, um, or could Silu be Shiloh here? Uh, Kerbit Siloon, Silo, as we would know it today. Okay. And so I, I ran this by prominent Egyptologists that you've had on the show and by an Assyriologist to make sure that the translation worked from one language to another. Um, they all agree that it could very well be Shiloh. Silu could, could be Shiloh. In fact, it fits better in, in the context of, of what we're uh, exploring here. Now, think about what the Bible says of the gate of Shiloh. Not only do we have a gate of Shiloh mentioned here, but in the Bible we know that Shiloh has a gate, and that Eli dies in the gate of Shiloh. So interesting to, to keep that in mind. Now, we've not yet discovered the, the gate from that time period, but we think we know where it is. Now, he makes an accusation here, which is very rare in an Amarna letter. Usually they're sucking up to the king, but he says the king did nothing. Behold, servants who were joined to the Apiru— Zimreda of, of Lakishu, which is Lakish, uh, and Yapti Hada 
was slain in the city gate of Silu. So there you have it again. Two people, Turbasu and Yapitada, are slain in the city gate of Silu, and the king did nothing. So, let's, uh, let's backtrack uh, a hair here for the audience. Uh, the standard translation of Silu has been this fort down in the Egyptian, near the Egyptian delta. Doesn't make sense contextually. Maybe linguistically it might, but not contextually. In fact, you have Lachish mentioned in this context too, which is up in Canaan, right? This is mentioned in Joshua and a number of other places. So, and even even if let's say linguistically it's a possibility, it's no greater possibility than Shiloh would be. So they're right. equal linguistically, L but contextually, from, it's arguing, inferior. Yeah. Yes, much better. Now these two individuals, we don't know who they are, but the but the Pharaoh must have been familiar with who they were. So they must have been significant people. Maybe they were right. maybe they were maybe they were kings or administrators or something like that. Yeah, that's what it seems because the the emissary of Pharaoh, he's named earlier, his name is Suta. Uh, he's the commissioner of the king or the emissary of the king, the one who's in charge, probably goes by collecting tribute, you know, for, for Pharaoh. So this is a name that, that Pharaoh is supposed to know, or these names he's supposed to know. And this is important because as we excavate at Shiloh and continue to excavate in the coming decade there, and we find inscriptions, these are the types of names that will be on our radar. Yeah, excellent. All right, that's, that sets it up well. We're going to continue this discussion, Scott, because this, is, this really is a groundbreaking theory that you're putting forth, and I, I don't mean just an esoteric theory. It certainly makes a lot of sense on the surface. We're going to explore it further. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today. We're here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We're exploring the Amonor letters, in this case, a possible connection to biblical Shiloh, and we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We're talking about the Amarno letters and particularly letter 288, which actually may have two references to the biblical city of Shiloh. Okay, so Scott, um, maybe one question that a layperson watching might might ask about is, you know, uh, the different vowels that are in in in, in uh, here. Like, so we have Silu, Shiloh. Uh, just explain maybe about translation, especially of proper names, and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, vowels are problematic. Normally, in most most ancient languages, you tend to have the the consonantal script. And then uh, exactly what vowels go in, sometimes that's negotiable, uh, yes. what, what you're putting in there. And so this is why I, I uh, talked at length with an Assyriologist, because we're talking about a, a Babylonian script. And I wanted to make sure that in the translation, you know, by the time we get into English as Silu, that we're not, not playing with the vowels in a way that's, that's not allowable in the language. And uh, he affirmed that it translates very clearly, and it could very well be be Shiloh. And the and the S and the sh sound are very close to one another, and sometimes those were conflated as well. Am I right about that? Even though those th those are consonants. Okay, so yep. maybe for audience members who might be asking wh why the difference, we have this translation issue between, especially a language like Akkadian, which is a dead language. So uh, whereas Hebrew yeah. is still still a live language. So. Um, so if this is correct, this is telling us that there is a city gate, which would imply a fortification structure around Shiloh in the early 14th century BC. Uh, talk about that a little bit, and as an archaeologist, uh, that's got your, mm. ear, your ears up in terms of your, your long-term planning. Yeah, it really does, because the Bible tells us that there's a, a gate at Shiloh in the Iron Age, and now we have a second witness to that, if indeed Silu is, is equal to Shiloh here. 
Um, we think it's in the Southern approach. Uh, if someone is coming to Shiloh today from sort of the visitor center and they're coming up from the South to the North, there's that gentle slope and you've got Byzantine and Roman ruins there, remains, very nice, olive presses and things like that. Um, I think it's underneath there and uh, that stuff's going to have to be removed. Of course, this is going to take money to remove it, to restore it and put it somewhere else. And I think that's where we're going to find the, the gate that's referred to. Very good. Now, would you say also, perhaps, now it would be careful about inferences, but if, if, if the Israelites, the Habiru, killed these two individuals, this could imply that maybe there was a small-scale battle that took place at Shiloh, and it's just not recorded in the Bible. Um, That's per, right. Perhaps. So if there was a destruction involved, we would want to look for that, perhaps. Now, the biblical text doesn't tell us any of that. But this is where we're allowed to innovate a little bit. As long as we're not yeah. vi violating the text of Scripture, we can have innovation sure. in the work of archaeology. Maybe comment on that a little bit about, about that relationship. Well, I mean, but here's another possibility. Maybe uh, these two gentlemen, I'll give you their names again, Turbasu and Yaptihada, they may have been outsiders, like representatives of Pharaoh, Egyptians, who are attempting to come into Silo, which is under Habiru control, and they don't make it in, they're killed in the gate. Very good. So there's so that's normally where you would have archers and you know your military would be supporting the gate. Okay. They're trying to come in and, and so the king's representatives may be killed there by those occupying Shiloh, which according to the Bible, that's Joshua in the in the Hebrews, according to the Marna letters. In my view, that's the Habiru. The Habiru, okay. So that's good. That's another possible inference. Maybe not a battle, what I'm suggesting, but maybe they're emissaries that are sent that are just assassinated, basically, is, yeah. is what it comes down to, right? Yeah, and I'm not aware of any other letter among the Amarna correspondence where you have that, you know, where two people are called by name and they're, they're killed in the gate of a city. Yeah, so it's very, it's very specific, and obviously the Pharaoh must have known. It's an appeal to the Pharaoh. You've not done anything. Look, these two guys were killed. He's got to know who they are, it seems to sure. me. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let, let's begin to sort of, uh, as we wind down, we've got a couple minutes, a couple minutes left here, sort of assimilate the larger picture here, Scott. Like, let's just draw back a little bit from, okay, we went down narrow to the Shiloh reference, but that, that bigger picture coming back from that again, if you, if you would, for the audience. Yeah, so again, we have this Amarna, Amarna correspondence. We're zeroing in on 285 to 290 letters from Abdihiba, king of Jerusalem. And I did not mention earlier that petrographic analysis has been done on these tablets where they scraped off a little bit of the clay, and sure enough, it's Jerusalem clay. So that gives it a, you know, a proximity and a verisimilitude. Um, we're saying that 288, one part of this Jerusalem correspondence, mentions a city called Silu that scholars up to this point have suggested was Sile or Churu, a fortress down in the Bala Lakes area of, of Egypt. And what I'm saying is that's very out of context with what we read in the Amarna letters, which are all about these Egyptian Canaanite city states, and that the the toponymy the, the etymology, if you will, works just as well with Shiloh as it does with Sile. So S-I-L-E or S-I-L-U. So we got a vowel, a yes. vowel difference there. It, it, it could work either way. If the Habiru are the Hebrews, which I argued in Five Views of the Exodus and, and others have, have written about, and if Silu is Shiloh, then we are really beginning, Henry, to, to get a picture of what life was like in Canaan at the time of the conquest. Yeah, it really, it really does. And this shows you the value of, of archaeology. When it's used properly in the ministerial support of the Word of God, it shows you, oh, Scott, it's so exciting because it's like this eyewitness nature of the text, too. You know, mm -hmm. the biblical text is said to have been written centuries later, and this archaeology really goes against that whole construct. I give you 30 seconds to wrap it all up, Scott, the whole Amarna letter <laughs> importance. Go ahead. Well, we have an ancient witness, not only the, the special revelation of the Bible, but the material culture is an additional witness that amplifies and illuminates. And in the case of those of us excavating in the hill country, 
and interested in conquest sites, the Amarna letters are gold. And so uh, Amarna letter 288 is going to be something we're going to be studying about, probably writing and researching on uh, in the coming years. Well, thanks, Scott, for joining us, and thanks for all the hard work you do and your expertise. We love you, man. We appreciate you. Thank you, man. All right, friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth today. You can see how excited we are about these connections between the archaeology and the Bible. We know the Bible is the Word of God, and it's, that claim is supported by the archaeological evidence. You can trust the scriptures and the great message of salvation that's given in them. Thank you for joining us.